Okay, everybody, welcome back. Um, we're going to take a break from the chaos stuff and talk about fractals now. Um, and this actually um, creates a very... Um, this complements the topic of chaos very well, and we'll get to that eventually. They're actually very well connected. Um, but they won't seem that way for a little bit, and I'll explain further um, how these two things connect. Um, but first, we really just have to define a fractal before we can do anything else. Um, so I'll pose you this following question. What makes a fractal? And so by that I mean like what characteristic is of a shape is necessary for it to be a fractal. So you might think of a fractal kind of as um, something like the Sierpinski triangle where you have a triangle, an equilateral triangle, and then you put, you perfectly inscribe a, an upside down equilateral triangle um, and you're gonna have to use your imagination here and pretend that the triangles I'm drawing are equilateral. Um, you perfectly inscribe an equilateral triangle inside that and then everywhere where there is a a right side up equilateral triangle you inscribe another upside down equilateral triangle and then you repeat this process over and over again forever and you get these this shape which is infinitely self-similar. If you zoom in to any of these triangles, you just keep seeing that same outer shape over and over again. Um, and if you had kind of a traditional education um, on the topic of fractals like I had, you might think that this self-similarity is what makes fractals what they are, is the self-similarity. So is it self-similarity? And I'm just going to go ahead and spoil it all for you right now. This answer is no. Always. Not. Not always. Um, fractals are not always self-similar. And the self-similarity of these... Um, th these sort of shapes certainly are fractals. But fractals are not necessarily self-similar. And so to understand that, you kind of need to understand some of the basic um, some of the some of the basic questions that the mathematicians who came up with this field were asking when they first came up with fractals. So the kind of father of fractal geometry is this guy Benoit Mandelbrot. And the big question that led him to come up with this theory of fractal geometry um, was something called the coastline problem. So what's the coastline problem? Well, for that, we have to consider the outer edge, the coastline of, of Great Britain. So here is um, the part where I totally embarrass myself and I try to draw Great Britain. I try to draw Great Britain at least some, or maybe some island that looks vaguely, looks vaguely like Great Britain. This is terrible, I know, I'm sorry. Um, but the idea here is you have some coastline and you want to measure it, so you use a measuring stick. And so say your measuring stick is this long. So you lay down all these measuring sticks back to back. And you do that all the way around and you measure the coastline of Britain. But you're not totally sure if that's accurate. So you make your measuring stick smaller and then you try it again. Um, and when you do it with the smaller measuring stick, you get a different answer, a very different answer you get a much, much longer coastline when you use a smaller measuring stick. Curious. Now you keep doing this for smaller and smaller measuring sticks and 
you're eventually led to believe that the coastline of Britain is infinitely long because this length just keeps getting longer and longer the smaller measures, measurement stick you use. Um, and this is true. This is actually what happens. I mean, to an extent, eventually you get down to the atoms, but we're not going to worry about that. Um, for all intents and purposes, these coastlines actually are infinitely long because of the roughness that continues to be exposed every time you zoom in to the coastline, every time you get a finer and finer image. And so a way to measure the amount of roughness in an object is something called fractal dimension. And so this is actually the concept that defines fractals more fundamentally than any sort of self-similarity that you might have been taught before. And so the real kicker here will be um, that most fractals actually have a dimension that's not one-dimensional, not two-dimensional, not three-dimensional, but actually something in between like 2.5 dimensional, a fractional dimension. In fact, it turns out that you can consider fractal dimension to be a contraction of the phrase fractional dimension, because fractals often have fractional dimension. Now, don't let that freak you out too much. Um, we're going to start from the basics, and I'm going to show you how we end up with this fractional dimension story. But to do that, we're going to need to consider three shapes, three shapes whose dimension we're very, very familiar with, and then one shape whose dimension we're maybe not so familiar with. So let's first consider a line. And so we'll have a line that has some length. That's one of our shapes. Next, we have a square. And so I'm going to draw a perfect square. Wow, incredible square. Good work. Um, now we'll have a cube, again, perfect cube, and so we're very familiar with the fact that this line would be one dimensional, this square would be two dimensional, and this cube would be three-dimensional. But now let's put for our last shape that same Sierpinski triangle, where we take the perimeter of an equilateral triangle, and we do this repeating self-similar process, where every time there's an, a right-side-up equilateral triangle, we inscribe it with an upside down equilateral triangle. You get the idea. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is uh, pretend that all of these are made of some sort of metal so that they have mass. Um, so let's consider that, let's pretend that this is like some sort of very thin rod put thin rod and let's say that this square is made out of some like thin sheet metal and this cube this cube is a solid cube so it's just a solid metal cube And we'll think of the Sierpinski triangle as being made of some sort of mesh, some sort of metal mesh. So each one of these, so the metal is just where the outlines of these triangles are. And so this is just some, it turns out to be infinitely dense mesh because we have infinite triangles as we zoom in on this. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to take each of these shapes and scale their lengths down by one half. So let's take this rod 
and scale it down by one half. So what we have now is a rod that is half the length. Um, and so this has something that I will call the length scaling dimension. And this is the amount that the length has been scaled down. No, sorry, not length scaling dimension. Um, length scaling factor is what I meant to say by that. So this length scaling factor is one half because its length is now one half of what it originally was. And it also has something called a mass scaling factor. And this is also one half because this has one half the mass of that. So if you have this to make it the size of this, you'd need two of these. You put two of them together and get something that has the same mass as that. Great. Um, that might not make too much sense to you right now, but I think it'll make sense when we move on to the square. So let's go ahead and move on to the square, um, this thin sheet, and let's scale its length down by a half. So now we've got a square. Its length is one half the length of the original square. And so it's LSF, length scaling factor, is one half. And furthermore, its mass scaling factor. To figure out its mass scaling factor, we have to think about how many of these we would need to make this. Um, and so if you tried to fill this bigger one in with these smaller, uh, these smaller squares that are half the length of the original square, you would need four of them. There we go, one, two, three, four. Um, and so this mass scaling factor is one fourth. Let's try it again with the cube now. Make a cube whose length is one half the side length of the original cube. And so we've got something that looks like this now. And this length scaling factor, again, is equal to one half. And its mass scaling factor, this is equal, well, to figure out what it's equal to, we have to think about how many of these would fit inside this. And so you know this if you have like sugar cubes or some sort of cube that you have many of. Um, you have them, if you stack up it takes eight of them to make one larger cube, which actually has twice the height. So it would take eight of these to fit inside this, and so its mass scaling factor is one eighth. Now, here's where it gets kind of interesting. If you think about how each of these, each of these mass scaling factors is related to the length scaling factor, they're actually all perfect, perfectly integer powers of the length scaling factor. So what I mean is that this mass scaling factor, or let, we'll start with this one, this mass scaling factor, 1 8th, that's equal to 1 half to the third. This mass scaling factor, 1 4th, is equal to 1 half to the second power, and this mass scaling factor is equal to 1 half to the first power. And so what follows is that this, you could say, um, precisely, defines the defini the, precisely defines the dimension of each of these shapes. So this is 1D, this is 2D, and this is 3D. Great. Um, so we have this, we have that the, ma the power that relates the mass scaling factor to the length scaling factor defines the definition. So let's carry on and try it with this one. Let's try it with the Sierpinski triangle. So scale it down to one half the length. We get something that looks like this. 
Yeah, 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 you get the idea. So this, again, length scaling factor is one half. But what about its mass scaling factor? Well, that, for that, we need to consider how many of these would make one of these. And as you can see, this is exactly like one third of the bigger one. So we would need three of these, one here, one here, and one here, to make the bigger one. And so its mass scaling factor you'd expect to be one third. But what we need to think about now is how that's related to the length scaling factor. Because before we had all these nice integer powers, but what happens if we say that this is equal to one half to some power d? How do we figure that out? Well, I'm going to need to clear off some space for this, but if your head is starting to go in the direction of the logarithm, then I'm very impressed. Um, but also, yes, you're right. So we have mass scaling factor. Mass scaling factor is equal to the length scaling factor to the dimension. So one third is equal to one half raised to the d. Okay, um, what we should first do is distribute out this power into this fraction. So this is equal to 1 to the d um, over 2 to the d, um, which is just equal to 1 over 2 to the d, because 1 to any power is just itself, it's just 1. So now we have 1 third equals 1 over 2 to the d, cross multiplying gives us that 3 is equal to 2 to the d. And so now what we need is to get d, and what we'll do to do that is use a logarithm. Uh, particularly, we'll use log base 2, because the base is the thing that's being raised to a power, log base 2 of 3. This is asking what power do I raise 2 to? to get 3. And the answer, d, we can do it with our calculator. This, if we do it in base 10s, base 10 is easier to type into the calculator, is equal to log base 10 of 3 over log base 10 of 2. And so doing that, log 3 divided by log 2 equal to 1.585 about. And so this, following the same logic as with our rod and our cube and our square, has dimension 1.585. So it's a greater dimension than 1, lesser dimension than 2. Um, so that's one example of a fractal that displays this fractal dimension concept, which they all should. Okay, so now I'm just going to run through one more example of a fractal that follows this um, concept, and then we'll do more practice with this in class, because it is very confusing, and it's normal to be very confused by it. Okay, so let's consider another example. And that example will be the middle thirds cantor set. This is one of the simplest fractals in existence. And the way you make it is you start with a line, and then you erase the middle third of the line. So if this starts at 0 and ends at 1, you're, rela you're erasing the interval from 1 third to 2 thirds. So you go ahead and erase that interval, and then you repeat with what's left over. So you've got 
you'll erase the middle third from this dingus here and this dingus here. And then again, erasing middle third, erasing middle third. And you get the idea. You just keep erasing the middle third of these intervals that are left. Now, let's take this and scale down its length. Um, and what we'll find is it's easiest to scale down. Um, the length that we want to scale it down to will depend on the fractal in question. Um, in this case, it'll be easiest to scale it down um, to a third its length. So we're going to do that. Take this whole thing and scale it down to one third. Now, again, we're making this fractal where we erase the middle third. And again, these intervals should all have infinitely many middle thirds removed from them. And so in this case, we've got an LSF of one third because the, this length is one third the original length. And we've got a mass scaling factor. Well, it looks like to make this bigger one, we would need two of these because one of them would take this, one of them would be this part and one of them would be that part. And this middle bit is empty. So it would take two of these to make this. So our mass scaling factor is one half. And now again, our formula was mass scaling factor is equal to length scaling factor raised to the d. So one, let's go over here, one third is equal to one half to the d. Um, and so this means that three is equal to two to the d, or d is equal to log So I wrote this formula wrong a second ago. It's actually that log, it's actually that the length scaling factor is equal to the mass scaling factor raised to the D. Um, and so actually what we'll have here is that one third raised to the D is equal to one half. And so this means that two is equal to 3 raised to the d, or d is equal to log base 3 of 2. And so using our calculator, we'll just do that. We'll do um, log, log base 3 of 2. And what we get is 0.631. And so this fractal, this Cantor set, is a little bit more than zero dimensional, but a little bit less than one dimensional. And that's what defines its roughness, per se. Um, so this, it's normal for this to be confusing, but what I want you to get out of this is the relationship between the mass scaling factor and the length scaling factor and how that relates to dimension. Uh, so check out the self quiz uh, to make sure you're good with that. We'll spend class um, investigating how you would compute this dimension for different self-similar fractals. And then for Thursday, we're going to start talking about how to apply this to real shapes in actual life, like the coastline of Britain or the waves in the ocean or the coastline of Canada or the... Um, uh, the ridgelines of Vermont or the coastline of Russia or you get the idea. So check that out. I'll see you soon and we'll get through lots of practice of this. Thank you.